So I, I led the communion service this month, and I touched a little bit on the marriage supper of the Lamb. And, uh, you know, we just have a short time of a devotional usually for communion. But as I was studying for that, I said, wow, there's just a lot here that I hadn't thought about and, uh, and just how it relates to ourselves as the church, the capital C church, right? Not the building. We talked about that in our praise team practice tonight. But uh, just how this uh, relates to us uh, as believers and how we are the bride of, of Christ and he is our bridegroom and just the, the picture that marriage is to give of, of the relationship Christ has with his church. And yeah, I just got studying and I said, I need at least a half hour, 40 minutes to touch on this. So that's what we're going to do tonight. All right, is that okay with you guys? So we're uh, going to look at this passage. I've titled the message, Our Eternal Marriage. Our e- Eternal Marriage. So as a bit of an introduction, have, we ever, have you ever thought about marriage, the history of marriage? Where did it come from? Why do we do this? You know, did Adam and Eve look at each other and say, I think we should get married, and uh, they instituted marriage? Or is it something the government placed on us many moons ago? Uh, You know, something that a a king had come up with in in the the dark ages. Uh, No, this is God's idea. It was God's idea uh, that uh, we, you know, many people would be given to marriage. And there's a reason. There's a reason he has instituted marriage. And without getting into it, I'll maybe touch on this in another sermon. You know, what's the purpose? What's the purpose of earthly marriage? Uh, marriages. And I do understand not all of us are are given to marriage. Uh, Some uh, have, uh, the Lord has given them the gift of of celibacy, and he he has his reasons for that and everything. But uh, the purpose of an earthly marriage, one of the purposes is to illustrate, is to illustrate Christ being the groom, we being the bride, how he's laid down his life to clean us, to forgive us of sins, and take us as his own. And that as we are given to earthly marriage, as we live uh, with our spouses, we are to love them uh, sacrificially, unconditionally. And in these ways, we paint a picture, uh, not a perfect picture, but we seek to paint a picture to the world of Christ's love for his bride. And uh, that's all I'll touch on uh, with that. So again, Christ is the bridegroom. We, the church, are his beloved bride. Uh, you know, some passages where we see this in John 3 and verse 29, and then a lot of Ephesians 5, uh, we see, uh, you know, Christ, uh, uh, that how marriage is given as an example uh, for Christ and the church. So if you're a born-again believer here tonight, you are in an eternal uh, marriage with the, a perfect groom, okay? Uh, the one who has laid down his life to wash away your sin and to clothe you in his righteousness, you know, making you white as snow. And so what we're going to do tonight, I have three points, and we're going to touch on three old wedding customs, uh, kind of, you know, how things were in the New Testament uh, along the lines of marriage, and some cultures very well may still uh, kind of hold to some of these things. So we're going to look at three old wedding customs that you know, you're not typically going to see maybe uh, here in North America and see how it relates and speaks to our marriage with the Lord Jesus. Let's pray. Father, as we open up your word here tonight, I want to thank you for each and every one that's here this evening. Uh, Lord, I, I pray that your spirit would make us receptive to your word and Lord, that we would see an accurate picture of the Lord Jesus and how precious a groom he is to us and what he's done to buy us and to himself. And so, Lord, I I pray that you would uh, speak through me tonight and that your word would really come to life and impact uh, us here tonight. I thank you for each and every one here. I pray that you would bless them this evening, and I ask this in Christ's name. Amen. So, three kind of stages of marriage, so to speak, that uh, you know, we, we saw in biblical times. That's what we're going to talk about here tonight. And uh, they just happened to all start with MC. Uh, it just kind of worked out that way. So point number one, you could call it stage or phase one uh, of, of marriage here, our eternal marriage, is the marriage covenant. Okay, the marriage covenant. And then we're going to talk about 
how the Messiah comes, and then we're going to talk about how uh, we are a part of the meal celebration, okay? So those are our three points, marriage, covenant, the Messiah comes, and the meal celebration. So marriage customs uh, of that day were very, very different than how they are today. You know, we, we have a very different way of, of doing things here in North America compared to the New Testament times, okay? And, and I'm sure you know that as well. Well, to start things off, there would be a marriage uh, contract, really, and this would have been signed by parents of the bride and groom, and the parents of the groom, or the groom himself would have to pay a bride price to the parents of the bride. And once he paid the bride price, this would start the betrothal period. And so I'm sure many of you here have heard of that term, and the closest thing we have here to North America would, in North America would be an engagement. But this was a very, very serious engagement. This was like an engagement on steroids. This was intense. This was a legal thing. And to break off a betrothal, uh, they would, the parties would have to sign a bill of divorce. That's how serious it was. You know, and, and this is the, the period uh, where we see Joseph and Mary, you know, when she was found with child, the Lord Jesus. They were in, their, in the betrothal period. So keep your finger in Revelation 19 and then just uh, slip over to Matthew chapter 1. We have a couple verses to read there. Matthew chapter 1. Somebody like to read verse, verses 18 and 19 for us. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. So what is meant here by, you know, he, 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 Joseph, he's a good man. It says here he's a just man, didn't want to, to make a big deal of this. He decided to uh, put her away secretly, not make a, a, a public thing of, of going ahead with a bill of divorce and all this, because why is this lady, uh, why is Mary pregnant and all the confusion around here? And, and so this to put her away, to break off this betrothal would have required a bill of divorce. So I just wanted to stress the seriousness of this contract, of this betrothal period. It's not how things go here in North America. It's not how dating or courting or engagements uh, work. Uh, you know, we know that some people, they'll be engaged and then they'll just decide, well, uh, you know, I've something has come up and I just see this person in a different light or there's been unfaithfulness or whatever and, and we know of couples that will break off uh, an, an engagement, right? It, but there's no papers to be signed, all the, this kind of thing, right? But that wasn't the case here with the betrothal, okay? And now, again, some parts of the world would maybe still kind of hold to this tradition and some parts of the world I know still do hold to the tradition of a bride price, and so a bride price, you know, in order for this, this young man to uh, be betrothed to this, this woman, would have to pay her parents a bride price. So this would have been a sum of money or maybe a, a quantity of goods. It could be some possessions. You know, it could be some chickens that this person has or, yeah, a certain amount of money or, or whatever, you know, build, make, make them something. Uh, but yeah, this was required uh, to enter into this betrothal period. And yeah, we don't, I don't know of that happening too often here in North America. Uh, however, when I was chatting with my uh, now father-in-law, uh, Mr. John Entz, we were talking, and this was, this was the talk, okay? I had uh, been dating Johanna for a little while, and, and I wanted to have the talk with, with Mr. Entz and ask for her hand, Right? Uh, asked for her hand in, in marriage. And so we were chatting, and uh, he did most of the talking, actually. And uh, 
And so I was trying to slip in there that, yes, I want your, he kind of knew what was going on. He kind of knew why I called him into my office to, to talk. And I don't know how this idea of a bride price came up. I don't know if he brought it up or something, but he said, Micah, I'd like a bag of coffee, okay? <laughs> it's like, okay, whoa. I think your daughter's worth a little more than that, John. You know, so yeah, I did give him the coffee. And was a, he said, yes, you can marry my daughter. And then he went on talking about some other story he had, you know, uh, but I got his approval. And uh, sweetie, you're worth way more than a bag of coffee. You got to know that, okay? And your dad knows that too, right? I hope he doesn't see this video. But, uh. but what, when we think about Christ, when we think about the perfect bridegroom and what he paid for us, his bride, we think of the ultimate price. And when you look at the cross, the price that the Lord Jesus had to pay to buy us, the church, his groom was his life. He laid down his life for us. We know in 1 John chapter 3 and 16, by this we know love. You want to know what love is about? By this we know love, that he, the Lord Jesus Christ, the perfect Lamb of God, laid down his life for us. This was his bride price, the ultimate price. And see, when we turn from our sins and trust Christ as Savior, we enter into a covenant with him, a, a, a binding marriage contract that has been signed and sealed by his blood. This is good news uh, for you and I, if we're a part of the bride of Christ. There's no divorce papers, okay? That's what we believe. The Bible teaches once he has uh, saved us and taken us on as his bride, you know, there's no backing out. There are no divorce papers uh, on his death, so to speak. Speak. He never backs out of this relationship with us. Christ has signed and sealed this covenant with his blood. And I don't want to take a whole lot of time to talk about contract versus covenant, but I think a lot of people today, sadly, they will treat a relationship like a contract. And a contract kind of works like this. Well, I will love you if... So a contract, they put conditions on the love or the relationship. They say, well, I kind of, you know, maybe it's not written down, it's just in their mind, but they say, you know, they, there's some strings attached. I will commit to this relationship or love you if. Well, that's a contract type thing. You think of it in sports terms, right? There are sports contracts, and, and if a hockey player is, is due for a new contract next year, well... If he didn't really produce this year, if he didn't score the goals he was supposed to, if he wasn't uh, a valued member of the team, he's not maybe going to get a very good contract. So it's a conditional thing. But that's not how this relationship, if you're a part of the, the bride of Christ, it's not how the Lord Jesus works, and we can be thankful for that. It's a covenant. This relationship that we are in with the Lord Jesus is a covenant. It's very different than a contract. You see, there are no conditions attached. Once he has paid for our life with his blood, he loves us no matter what. See, a, a covenant works like this. I will love you even if this happens or this or this or this. And so we know, you and I, we're being honest with each other uh, tonight, we still fail. We still sin. We can still mess up. But the beauty of the gospel is, and we see this truth in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 13, he remains faithful when, even when we are faithless. He remains faithful to us even when we are faithless. He loves us even if we fall and we stumble. And the thing about the gospel is knowing this should help us to not want to sin. Wow, Jesus is going to love me. Even if I do fail him, if I do sin and I mess up, yes, he will. And this should motivate us, this gospel should motivate us to want to live holy lives before him because he does love us unconditionally. We are in a covenant with him. And in our own relationships, whether it's with a spouse or a family member, we need to love them unconditionally as well. We need to think of our, our marriages, our relationships as, as a covenant. We're not just going to throw this away because uh, things aren't going well. Christ
Christ always keeps up his end of the bargain. He loves us, his bride, even if we are wayward. And that should uh, cause great praise and worship in our hearts to know that he remains faithful even when we are faithless. So we're in an eternal marriage with a perfect groom, the Lord Jesus. We're in a blood-bought covenant with him. So that's a bit about the marriage covenant. Now, number two, uh, the Messiah comes, okay? So this is kind of step two in the marriage process. So in the New Testament times, usually about a year after the betrothal period started, was when the groom, accompanied by some of his male friends, would go to the house of the bride-to-be at midnight. Now, this is something that she knew about, okay? So it wasn't a surprise type thing. She knew that day was coming, and she was to be ready, okay? This bride-to-be was to be ready for when the groom and his friends came along in this torchlight parade. So let's just turn to Matthew uh, chapter 25, okay? We're going to read uh, some verses here, so turn with me to Matthew 25. And could I have somebody uh, read the first 13 verses of Matthew 25, it's the, the parable of the ten virgins. So, uh, Matthew 25, verses 1 to 13. <coughs> then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, all slumbered, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming, go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, The door is <coughs> open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore for you, know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Thank you, Percy. So for sake of time, we're not going to unpack these 13 uh, verses. A lot of you are familiar with this parable. Just to sum it up in one quick sentence, the main idea uh, behind this passage is be ready. Be ready for the return of Christ. And we don't know when that's going to be. And there's a sense of urgency there for us. We need to check our own hearts, make sure that we are ready, that we're found in Christ, that we know him. But then there's a sense of urgency as far as evangelism. And those around us, if they don't know the Lord, you know, we don't know when he is going to return. We don't want to be passed by. We want to be a part of this, uh, this wedding uh, parade, this torchlight parade uh, to the, the marriage supper of the Lamb. So the main idea here is to be ready. Be ready for his return. Now, the, the bride-to-be would have known, and, and, you know, in these cases, when to be ready. You know, would have known when her, her groom-to-be wa was coming, and, and there was a preparation there, right, to be ready. And uh, I've been to a number of weddings uh, over the years, and it's not uncommon for the bride to be a little late, Okay, everybody's in, at the service, right? You know, Bob's done some weddings, pastor, and uh, have all your brides been on time? No. <laughs> it takes a little while to get ready, I guess. I'm not sure all what they're doing, but they're getting ready. They're getting all pretty. And uh, yeah, sometimes we're, we're waiting around and, well, the show still goes on, doesn't it? Right? If she's five minutes late. I was to a wedding once where the bride was 45 minutes late, okay. but it still happened. But that's not the case when we think of the return of the Lord, okay? He's not going to come and then, okay, there's a second chance, you know, and 45 minutes later, somebody repents of their sin and puts their faith and trust in Christ. That's not going to happen. 
we need to be ready. There's a sense of urgency there. So Jesus, the church's groom, is coming for his bride at some point. Are you ready? Are you a part of his church? Are you a part of those who, uh, as it says in Hebrews 9, verse 28, look for him? Right, this idea of looking for him, right? It, it being expectant. And then in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 8, those who love his appearing. Can you say that tonight? Are you looking forward to the return of Christ? Do you love his appearing and long for that? You know, I know that sometimes I, there are days that I long for that more than others. You know, maybe if it's a bad day or something discouraging has happened, but we should all long for that. This world is fading away, and we should be excited that our perfect groom is coming for us. And hopefully, you know, at, at, at most weddings, hopefully at your own wedding, uh, if you're married here tonight, that uh, you were looking forward to seeing one another, right? Right? You know, I, I know I was very excited to see Johanna uh, come into the church and be walked down the aisle, and uh, hopefully she was excited to see me too, and we're not sure, still trying to figure that out. No. She just wanted to make sure I still had the beard on. <laughs> she wasn't going to marry me if I shaved, so, all right. So we're, uh, you should also be looking forward to this return of Christ with great anticipation. Are you ready for his return and excited for that? The precious Lord Jesus, our perfect eternal groom, is coming for us soon, and we must rejoice and have hope and peace in that. And then third point here, uh, warn you it's my longest, but we'll, we'll go through it. We're going to go back to Revelation 19. So if you have your finger or your book uh, mark in Revelation 19, just slip over to that. So the third and final phase of uh, wedding customs of the day there was a marriage supper prepared. And this, from what I understand in, in reading and studying this this week, this marriage supper could go on for days. That would be awesome. Anybody else here would have, yeah? A feast for days? That's all right. You know, and you, know, you hear a fasting for days, and that's good. That's a, a good uh, spiritual discipline to do every now and then. But so this marriage supper uh, celebration would have happened right after a ceremony and uh, just after, you know, that parade and everything, the torchlight parade at midnight. And uh, yeah, this would be a huge celebration. You know, we, we still have something similar to that in, in North America. A lot of weddings would have a marriage uh, or a, a reception at the end of a wedding where there's usually some food and speeches and different things like that. Uh, so it's kind of like that. So here in the book of Revelation, what John's uh, vision shows here in chapter 19 is the wedding feast of the Lamb, which is Jesus Christ and his bride, the church, all the redeemed of the Lord. This is the third and final stage. So this marriage supper of the Lamb takes place in heaven between the rapture and the second coming. And so we're going to pick things up uh, here in Revelation 19, and I'll read for you verses 6 through to 10, so you can follow along with me. And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, as the sound of many waters, and as the sound of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. Let us be glad and rejoice, give and give him, pray, give him glory. For the marriage supper of the Lamb has come. And his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, write, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, see that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. Are you saying, don't worship me, worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So the Lord was uh, giving John, uh, who was inspired you know, you know, by the spirit of God to write the revelation, and, and he 
the Lord was using an angel to reveal these things uh, to John. And, you know, John was going to worship this angel, but the angel said, no, worship God. You know, I'm just the messenger here. You know, you need to worship him. Don't worship me. And so picking things up here in verse uh, 6, you know, John's receiving these visions about the future from Jesus, yet through an angel. And in this vision, he hears, as it were, the voice of a great multitude. So what, who, who is he referring to here? Who is he talking about here as the great multitude? Well, this is the church, the capital C church, the universal church of God. This is all believers. This is the bride of Christ. He's referring to the great multitude as all of those who are redeemed. So if you are a part of the family of God, you're part of Christ's bride, the ones that he has redeemed with his blood, and you're going to be a part of that. I'm going to be a part of that by God's grace, part of that great multitude. Notice here in verse 6 that John doesn't describe what he hears as voices, plural. He doesn't say the voices of a great multitude, but he writes voice. And that struck me as I was reading this week. The voice, it's one voice. Though many, many people make up the bride of Christ, all of those who are saved on earth now, those who will be saved in the future and in the past. He likens this great noise he hears, right, this multitude, he refers to it as a voice. And that struck me as I I was studying, why voice and not voice is. I think it might speak to uh, us as the universal church being as one, You know, Christ, the bridegroom, has one bride. All those who have repented and believe are one in Christ. And we're to be unified. We're to be unified here on this earth as the body of Christ. And we will be unified when we sit around this table and we cry out in praise to the Lord Jesus as one voice. As one voice. So we're to be unified, just like we see this picture uh, that John is writing down. He's getting this vision from an angel. It's ultimately from, from God. You know, us, the bride, we're one. We're unified. We have one voice. You know, sadly, I know that we can be so easily divided. We can be so easily disunified here on earth. We need to keep in mind that it is Jesus, it is our groom that unites us. So we think of all the believer, all that we have in common as believers. We have so much in common, uh, that unity that we have in Christ. So when we dwell on that and we think about verses like this, one day, no matter what kind of a small temporary disunity we have amongst ourselves, within our church, within our country, whatever that is, That's all going to be put aside. All those little squabbles, all those little uh, fights, the disunity, the discord that we've had, that's all going to be put aside. It's going to be washed away as we're around that great table and we, with one singular voice as a great multitude, cry out in unity to the Lord Jesus and we say, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigns. And that, that convicted me a bit as I was studying. You know, and that, I think it just puts things into perspective. We can get so tied up with the the things that are going around us and and the disunities and and the struggles, and we forget to think about the future. We, We forget to think about what we're going to be doing around this table, how we're going to be crying out in worship together with one voice to the Lord. That's going to be an amazing moment. And then John is trying to describe what he's hearing, and he's trying to put it into to words that his audience would understand. And so, you know, he, he gives these pictures here of uh, the sound of many waters, he says, and then the sound of mighty thunderings. And when I was thinking about the sound of many waters, my mind went to the ocean or to the waves crashing. And then I said, well, what's kind of the, the noisiest body of water I've ever heard? And uh, I think it was when I was a young teenager, our family took a vacation to Ontario, and we went to Niagara Falls. Anyone here been to Niagara Falls? 
That thing's not quiet, is it? I mean, if you stand right at the edge there, at the Canadian side of the falls, not the American side, right? No, the Canadian side, the nice big one, the horseshoe and everything. That thing is loud. They say that about 700,000 gallons of water, 700,000 gallons are pouring over every second. The noise that makes, it's so powerful. So when I was trying to think of this great multitude crying out in praise to the Lord Jesus with one voice and how he's liking it to, to many waters, I was thinking about standing there at the edge of the Niagara Falls. But then to add to that, I was saying, well, what if you were standing there? And he goes on to say uh, the sound of many thunderings as well. Okay, so what if you're standing at the edge of the Niagara Falls and then a huge rain and thunderstorm comes? I mean, that would be even more intense. So then you're getting the added noise of the rain falling and the thunder. And I mean, I'm sure that this just pales in comparison, this illustration, to what it's actually going to be like. And that's something that we can look forward to. For some of you, uh, you were at the SING conference with the Gettys uh, at New Brunswick Bible Institute last night. That was a, a really great event. And uh, I don't know, they were thinking around 800 of us were there. 900, you heard? Yeah. And that was just a really amazing moment to be singing praises to the Lord with 900 brothers and sisters in Christ. And a few of us had the privilege to be in Nashville uh, for uh, the, the bigger concert that the Gettys put on. And one of the, the main events of the, the week was a concert at the Bridgestone Arena. So this is where the, the big fancy you know, country music artists are playing, and the Nashville Predators play there, uh, the hockey team. And uh, we were there in this arena with about 13,000 brothers and sisters in Christ singing praises to the Lord. And even just thinking about it now gives me some goosebumps. And what we were saying, those of us who were there, we were talking about how, you know what? This is maybe a tiny taste of what heaven's going to be like. You know, and that's just a small fraction of believers around the world, and, and obviously you think of uh, the last you know, thousands of years and the believers that will come in the future. What an amazing thing to be a part of singing praises to the Lord with thousands of people. And we just don't, we don't know how many people are going to be around this table, around this marriage supper of the Lamb, uh, you know, millions, I'm sure, billions even. So let's move on to verse 7 here, and uh, so here we see... Uh, there's a call to be glad and to rejoice and to give him glory. Why? Why are we to be glad and rejoice and to give him glory? Well, not only because the Lord is omnipotent and he reigns, but also because the marriage supper of the Lamb has finally come. This is something that we've been looking forward to. We've been anticipating for years and years and years. It's finally here. You know, we've waited for this for a while, and we're excited to finally be with our perfect groom, the Lord Jesus, the one who has laid down his life for his bride. And you see, part of the excitement I know around wedding days is this whole getting ready part. You know, yes, the bride gets ready, and, you know, parents are getting ready, the groom is getting ready, everybody that's standing in the wedding, and, you know, flower girls, ring bearer. You're getting the church decorated, and, you know, you just went through this, Carla, not too long ago, and, you know, you're decorating downstairs, and, I mean, it's months and months or six weeks of planning a wedding, right, sweetie? <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so it's just, there's a lot of preparation, and, 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 and a big part of that as well, what are we going to wear, especially for the bride? I mean, there's shows about this, picking out dresses. They, they have shows about this now. And so, yeah, I guess one aspect of, uh, of getting ready, again, is what we're wearing. Yes, the groom, but especially the bride. And when we think about the marriage supper of the Lamb and us, the bride of Christ, sitting around that table, we, there's this, there's this uh, preparation for ourselves to make us ready for this day. And how does that happen? Well, in verse 8, we see that uh, it says, to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen. It was granted. It was given for the bride of Christ, us Christians, 
to be arrayed, to be dressed in fine linen, clean and bright, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. So we're clothed now in the righteousness of Christ, we're in fine linen, we are clean and bright, we're no longer dirty or tainted with sin. And this word granted, it, you know, it means given, or it means given from somebody else. That's really important for us to understand. This righteousness, this uh, adornment in fine linen, this, this pure white clothes that we're wearing here at the supper was not something that we brought out of our own closet in our own good works. What Our good works are like what? Filthy rags. So this, these clothes that we have, what we're wearing, this fine linen, this, this righteousness is not of our own. Somebody had to give it to us. And we know that that was the precious Lord Jesus. It was granted to us. It was given, right? Somebody else had to clothe us in righteousness, and that was the precious Lord Jesus. It was given. It wasn't earned. We now stand forgiven, holy, sinless, before our eternal groom. Praise God. He's cleaned us up, you know, and he puts us at the marriage table. We're pure. We're spotless. I mean, so the idea, you know, that the tradition of usually the bride is wearing white at the wedding, you know, is to symbolize that purity uh, as, as she goes before her, her soon-to-be husband. That's what's happening here. We have been dressed in, in pure white by the righteousness, not of our own, but of the Lord Jesus. He is the one who has enabled us to be at this uh, marriage supper of the Lamb. So we recognize that only those who are dressed in the righteousness of Christ can be there at this table. Nobody who is impure can be there. Nobody is going to be sneaking into this meal. So how do we get there? Well, in verse 9, it says, And he said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are called. Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And if you have an English uh, standard version, it, it, instead of the word called, it says invited. All right? A part of preparing for a wedding is sending out invitations, isn't it? Okay? So you're thinking about, okay, we got some family and friends, and we're going to send out these invites. And uh, has anybody heard the uh, phrase wedding crashers before? People that are at weddings and like, who are you? Why are you here? <laughs> who are you related to? <laughs> Um, you know, maybe we need to have a, a bouncer, you know, at each wedding and make, okay, are you on the list? You know, people need to be invited to a wedding and not, not just crash it. Well, we know here with this, uh, the marriage supper of the Lamb, it's only those who have been called of God, only those who have been invited to the meal are there. And the Lord extends that invite to all who would repent of their sins, turn from their sins and trust the Lord Jesus. So those who are true born again believers, those who have repented of their sins, put their faith and trust in Christ, those are the invited. Those are the ones who are called to be there to celebrate at this meal. So each and every person who has been called from of God out of darkness and into the light of the gospel will be there celebrating that we're finally with our groom, the Lord Jesus. And just as I wrap up, again, this was a snapshot of our eternal marriage with the Lord Jesus. I'm sure for many of you, that was a concept you already heard of and understood. Maybe that's new for you. Uh, but I, I was just interested to see how some of these, uh, these old customs, these wedding customs, and how they relate to us as the bride of Christ so again, this, is just, this was just a snapshot of our eternal marriage, the three stages that we, the redeemed of the Lord, will go through. So if you're a believer here tonight, you're a part of the bride of Christ. You know, and we have a perfect groom in the Lord Jesus. And we find ourselves somewhere in stage one, don't we? We're in the betrothal period, but we're excited about stage two. The, the Messiah is going to come. And then we're going to have a big celebration with all of the people of God adorned in his righteousness, singing his praises. 
And so what now? What, what do we do now? What, what are we to do while we're waiting? Well, we're to ready ourselves for his coming, right? We're to be sanctified, and, and he's doing that in our lives through, through trials and through different situations, and we're also to be a part of that. We're to, by uh, the grace and strength of God, be working on being holy, for he is holy. We should be loving him more and more. The more we get into his word, the more that we're with his people, the more we should be falling in love with our Savior, the Lord Jesus, our perfect groom. And we should be filled with joy and anticipation, knowing that he is on his way for us. And then something else we should be doing while we're waiting is inviting other people into that, right? Sharing the gospel, being a part of what God is doing here on this earth to save people and to bring him in to be a part of his bride so that we can all sing his praises someday around that table. And another thing we can do while we wait, when times are tough, okay, we're all going to go through them, we're all going to go through struggles, we're all going to go through trials, when times are tough, we can remember that one day the cares of this world will be gone, and we'll be around that table together, won't we? And we'll be reunited with loved ones, we'll be adorned in the righteousness of Christ, and what will we be singing? Hallelujah, alleluia. The Lord God omnipotent reigns with one voice, a great multitude with one voice. This is something that gives us great hope and we can be thankful for and it can help get us through the tough times, okay? Often in trials, it's about perspective. These times are going to fade away and we're going to one day be with our precious Lord Jesus and singing his praises singing praises to the one who laid down his life to buy his bride. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your goodness to us, Lord. I'm humbled, humbled by the gospel. Lord, that you would see uh, to invite even one person to this table. God, that is just scandalous grace that you would choose to extend an invite to even one, Lord. We don't deserve it. We are wretched sinners, Lord. You loved us so much that you sent your only son, the Lord Jesus, to die on the cross for us, to lay down his life, to purchase us, to be his bride. And Lord, we want to extend that invite to others. And if there are some here, Lord, tonight that don't know you, say, I, I'm, I'm still dirty, I'm still with sin. There's no righteousness in me. I'm, I'm not ready. I'm not adorned yet in pure white. I'm not ready for that marriage supper. Lord, I pray that your spirit would convict them, Lord, of their sin. But then, Lord, that your spirit would also lead them to the beautiful gospel that saves, that redeems. And so, Lord, may we walk out of here with eternity in mind. Lord, excited about that one day that we, as a great multitude with one voice, will sing your praises. And God, as we wait for that day, may we sing your praises in unity here on earth. We ask this in Christ's name, amen.